Okay, praise the Lord. This is Brother Clinton. Welcome to my living room once again. I was having a conversation with someone just a few minutes ago uh, via private message on YouTube uh, concerning a particular area of doctrine and prophecy. And it was impressed upon my heart as I was doing so to go ahead and make a video and discuss these things with you, whoever you are out there who are hungry for the word of truth. In these last days, there are so many prophecy teachers that are out there peddling their wares and selling their, their stuff and um, teaching people their pernicious doctrines. And because of these people, the way of truth is evil spoken of. And they've got the people on the, uh, on, in the mainstream. And the mainstream, when I say the mainstream, I'm talking about the same thing that Jesus was talking about when he said that there are those multitudes on the broad path that leadeth to destruction but strive to enter in at the straight gate. Um, these false prophecy teachers are teaching the people in the mainstream their pernicious doctrines, and these people in the mainstream are eating it up because they have not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and so God has sent upon them strong delusion. And so most people, the, the vast majority of people in the churches today, and I would venture, if you ask me for a percentage, I would venture to tell you probably 98% of people that profess to be Christians and go to something that they call a church are deceived and lost. Most of them don't even know how to become a Christian. Um, and of those that know how to become a Christian, most of them are deceived and lost in many other ways because they're listening to their theologians and their entertainers and they're not searching the scriptures. And in saying that, I don't make myself to be better than anybody because I'm not better than anybody. I'm the least of all saints. I'm the least of all men on the earth. And the only things that I know are the things that God has given me. And the only reason that I have those things is just because of his grace to seek him in his word and may he give you that grace to seek him in his word as well. I'm going to go into the book of Daniel with you in the ninth chapter and I'm going to go over four particular verses of the scripture. And when I go over these things, the things that I'm going to, to declare unto you and to show you from the scripture are going to be a lot different from those things that you have heard from the famous prophecy teachers uh, that are very popular and wealthy today. And as I go through these things and as I share these things with you, there are going to be some things that are going to cause your eyebrows to, to raise. There are going to be some things that are going to cause question marks to pop up in your brain. There are going to be some things that, that are going to cause you to think in your spirit, well, that's just not true. And the reason that you're going to think that is because it's not what you've been taught. And I would ask you this one thing in all fairness before we start. I would ask you that before you reject anything that I'm about to give you, that you judge it according to the scripture first and not according to what you have previously believed or what somebody else taught you. And if you judge it according to the scripture and you find it to be an error, then cast it away. But until that time, please don't cast anything away that I'm about to give you. And the reason that I say that is because what I'm about to give you is the word of God. I'm not asking you to believe anything that I say just because I say it. All I'm asking you to do is to judge what I say by the scripture and nothing else you'll be blessed. Praise the Lord. So let's get into the Word of God, and may God bless the reading of His Holy Word. I'm in Jan Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to start at verse 24 and go to the end of the chapter. Just to set a little background here, what's going on is that Daniel was a Hebrew child that was taken uh, with the captives when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was sent to destroy Jerusalem and take captive the people. Daniel uh, was a man who was raised up in Babylon and who became a great prince in Babylon. And he was a prophet to the people of Israel there. And this is something that was given to Daniel while he was there in Babylon. And it was sent by Gabriel, the angel, the archangel Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And so Gabriel is the one who is speaking to Daniel in this prophecy. When I'm about to read, when I begin reading in verse 24, Gabriel the angel is the one who is speaking. And he is sent from God with this message. Let's remember also that Daniel is a Jewish man. He was not a Christian. There were no Christians at that time. So this passage of scripture has nothing to do with Christians. It's a message to Daniel and to his people from God via the archangel Gabriel. Let's read in Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon my holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Praise the Lord. Okay, in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon my people and upon thy holy city. Okay, thy people, the Jewish people. Okay, 70 weeks... Uh, we know from various places in the scripture that Gabriel was speaking by the word of God about 70 weeks of years. These weeks are periods of seven years. Okay, I'm not going to go all into detail about that. If you have any questions about it, I can explain that to you. I'm going to go kind of quickly through verses 24 and 25 because the 26th and 27th verses are the ones that I want to kind of concentrate on. But these are 70 weeks of years. And it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay, thy people is the Jewish people. Thy holy city is Jerusalem. To do these things. To finish the transgression. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. And to seal up the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. Well, this is, of course, talking about the consummation of all things. This is what's going to happen to complete the work that God has in store and to establish his kingdom in the earth. And God said to Daniel that it would be that 70 weeks were determined upon his people and upon the holy city in order to accomplish that. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Okay, well, seven weeks and three score and two weeks, a score is 20, so three score and two is 62. Excuse me, yes, three score and two is 62, plus seven is 69. Okay, so there were 70 weeks determined upon the Jewish people and upon Jerusalem before this thing would come to pass, before the consummation of all things. And that, now Gabriel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Okay, right now Daniel was in Babylon when he's getting this revelation. And while he's in Babylon, Jerusalem has been destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed it. And later on there would come a king who would give the commandment to restore it. And we can see that in the book of Nehemiah. From that time that that king gave the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, there would be 69 weeks of years. 69. Uh, pardon me, I wasn't all prepared with notes before I before I did this, so I'm going to use my calculator here real quick. 69 times 7 is 483. So, it was 483 years from the time that that commandment was given to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, and it was exactly that. Okay, uh, when Jesus Christ came, it had been 483 years since the time of that proclamation that was given to Nehemiah to go and to build Jerusalem. Now the scripture says, The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Praise the Lord. Now why doesn't it just say 69 weeks instead of 7 weeks and 3 score and 2 weeks? Well, when you look in the book of Nehemiah, you'll notice in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 15, that it says that the the wall was built in seven weeks. Let's go there, Nehemiah 6.15. Nehemiah 6.15. So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month Elul in 50 and two days. So 49 weeks, excuse me, 49 days is 7 weeks. So 7 weeks and 2 days. And you'll notice also in Nehemiah 2.11 that Nehemiah did ride around the city 
for two or three days for three days before he started building the wall. So the wall was finished in seven weeks. And so that's why in verse 25, Daniel 9, 25, it says seven weeks and three score and two weeks because it's separating the building of the wall and then the building of the city. Okay, so seven weeks and three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And indeed it was because Sanballat and the enemies of the people of Israel kept trying to hinder them from building that wall and that city and they gave them all the trouble that they could because they knew that when that city was built it was going to give them trouble. And indeed it did. And after three score and two weeks, verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Okay, now these are weeks of years, just like it was saying in verse 24. Okay, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And that's exactly what happened. He was cut off out of the land of the living, Isaiah 53, 8. But not for himself. Okay, there was no sin in him. He wasn't cut off for himself. He wasn't killed because he was a criminal. He was put to death for you and me. It pleased the Lord to bruise him and to lay upon him the iniquity of us all because all we like sheep have gone astray. Praise the Lord. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the prince that shall come. Well, Messiah was cut off. And then 30-something years later, there was a prince that came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary. That prince was Titus the Roman. And he came with his army and raised Jerusalem to the ground. And that is the person that is being spoken of here. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. They destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. The Romans did in the, in the year 70 AD. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Well, this gets into some detail. But the end thereof shall be with a flood. In the 124th Psalm and also in the 12th chapter of the Revelation, the scripture speaks of a flood. That the earth and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood. Let's look in Revelation chapter 12 real quick, and I don't want to stay there too long because I, I don't want to make this video really long, but this is necessary. Revelation 12 verses 15 and 16. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, and the woman is Israel. And we know who the serpent is. The serpent is the devil and Satan. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Well, if we go back to the Psalms, it explains that passage of Scripture, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. Swallowed us up quick means they would have eaten us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Okay, so this is likening waters to the people of the earth. And also in the 17th chapter of the Revelation, the whore that sat on the, on the beast sat upon many waters. And the Bible says that the waters are the peoples of the earth. Okay, so in this case, like in many cases in the scripture, the waters are representative of people. So this flood is a flood of people. Remember Jesus said, when you see armies gathered around, around about Jerusalem, know therefore that the desolation thereof is nigh. And that's going to come in the last days, in the future from now. And so in the scripture in, in Daniel 9.26, it says, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Okay. Now the scripture skipped, the prophecy that was being spoken skipped from Titus and the Romans raising Jerusalem to the ground in the 70 A.D., unto a time that is still in the future from now, in the middle of a sentence. But that happens a lot in the scripture, especially in prophecy. So let's start, let's read verse 26 over again. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, that's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but not for himself, of course, because he died for the sins of the world, praise God. And the people of the prince that shall come, okay, Titus the Roman, shall come after the crucifixion of Christ. 37 years later. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
Okay, that happened. They destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And the end thereof, thereof, of Jerusalem, the city and the sanctuary, the end thereof shall be with a flood, which is a flood of people. When you see the armies encamped around, around Jerusalem, know therefore that the desolation thereof is nigh. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Amen. Okay, now verse 27. This is where many people get confused because the false teachers that have taken over in, in, in the, uh, the mainstream, the broad path that leadeth to destruction and the denominations. Verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He. Who is he? Well, in verse 25, it says Messiah the Prince. Messiah the Prince. And it keeps talking about him. Um, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And he, Messiah, verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now forget about what all these prophecy teachers have told you and just look at what the scripture is saying. Okay, these three verses of scripture, 25, 26, and 27, are talking about Messiah. Okay? The only other person that's mentioned in these three verses is the Prince of Rome, Titus, who raised Jerusalem to the ground in AD 70. Other than that, the only person that's being spoken of in these three verses of Scripture is Jesus Christ. Okay, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay? The prophecy teachers of these last days who are false and who are teaching pernicious doctrines, pernicious doctrines are telling you that this is Antichrist and that he's going to come and make a covenant with Israel for one week. That's a lie. It's not based in the scripture anywhere. It doesn't come from anywhere in the scripture. Okay, Forget about this seven-year treaty that people are talking about. It's not in the scripture anywhere. All that whole teaching is based upon a false understanding of this verse of scripture right here, this half of the sentence right here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. It doesn't say that he, whoever this is, shall make a covenant. It says that he shall confirm a covenant. To confirm something is not to create it. In order to confirm something, it must have already been created. You cannot confirm something that hasn't already existed. Okay? Um, I am a, a driver, and when I have a reservation for someone to pick them up in the morning, I call them in the evening to confirm that they want to be picked up in the morning. If they had never called me to be picked up in the morning, then it would be kind of silly for me to call them in the evening and confirm their reservation because there is no reservation. And in the same way, Jesus shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He, whoever this is, if it's, even, if it's not Jesus, he's come, it says that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So if he's confirming the covenant, there has to already be a covenant. Okay? It doesn't say that he's making a covenant. It says that he's coming to confirm a covenant. I've said that several times because I want to make it perfectly clear. Something cannot be confirmed unless it first already is established. So Jesus Christ, who this is talking about, came to confirm the covenant with many for one week. He, Jesus Christ, is a minister of the circumcision. He came to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the people of Israel. When Jesus Christ walked on the face of the earth, and the things that we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there was no Christian church, there were no Christians, there was no, no New Testament. There was no New Testament gospel being preached. There was only the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, coming to seek and save that which was lost among his own people Israel. When he sent forth his disciples, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. When he sent forth his disciples to preach, Remember in Matthew 10, he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, neither into any city of the Samaritans, but only unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When a woman came to him, because her daughter was vexed with the devil, but she was not of the people of Israel, he said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it into the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs under the table. And you know, another time Jesus said, in Matthew 15, something, 15, 26, I think, he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ came to confirm the covenant with many, his people Israel, 
for one week. Why one week? It was the 70th week. 69 weeks from the time that the, the, the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the coming of Messiah, the Prince. And then after that, there was one week left out of, that, out of those 70 weeks. That week began when Jesus Christ was baptized in the Jordan River by John. And that week was cut off in the midst three and a half years later from the time that Jesus Christ was baptized in the Jordan River by John until he was crucified and risen again was three and a half years. And we can tell that by reading the scripture of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and seeing how many times the Passover was mentioned in the Gospels. We can tell that he did what he did for three and a half years. And we, we can also tell that he did it for three and a half years because of passages of scripture like this that tell us that it was half of the week, and it was 42 months. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He came to confirm the covenant with his people Israel for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. What happened when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost? Three and a half years into this 70th week. When Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, the earth quaked, the rocks rent, and the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. The veil in the temple was that veil that kept the high priest and all the people from coming into that Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Testament was, where only one man came once a year and not without blood to offer for the sins of the people. That veil was there to separate the presence of God from the people so that only one man, the high priest, could come in there once a year and not without blood of bulls and goats and only in the exact way that God had said so that he could make atonement for the people of Israel. And now, when Jesus Christ died, that veil was rent from the top to the bottom, which showed, which signified, according to the writer of Hebrews, that the way into the holiest of all was now made manifest. And it was not into that place in the physical temple, but it was that place in heaven that people could come into by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ by coming into covenant with God through the New Testament gospel which was preached 54 days after the resurrection excuse me, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ so the Old Testament had passed and the New was nigh to come and so he caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease Okay, now they're not ceased forever because there, there's coming the time when Israel will yet again build their temple and Messiah will yet come to them and he will be the prince of Israel and sit on his throne in Jerusalem and the people of Israel shall do the sacrifices of the temple and keep the Sabbath days and keep the law as they were supposed to keep it in the beginning. But right now they're not doing that. And where is that temple that they're supposed to do their sacrifices in? It doesn't exist. Because the Bible says ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. We can see that Jesus Christ has fulfilled this perfectly. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate. For the overspreading of abominations the people of Israel filled that temple with abominations time and time again. Look in the days of, of Ezekiel the prophet when, when God took Ezekiel and, and, and showed him the temple and all the things that they were doing in the temple with their graven images painted on the wall and put it in, inside that temple and in secret rooms in the temple where they worship gods that are no gods. And for the overspreading of the abominations of the people of Israel, he shall make it desolate, it, the temple, that system of religion that they had that God gave them but they defiled. He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. The consummation, what is that? When a man and a woman decide to become married, and the man says, will you marry me? And she says, yes. They are betrothed one to another, and they are husband and wife, even as Joseph and Mary were husband and wife, when, his, when Mary became with child by the Holy Ghost. But their marriage had not yet been consummated. And if Mary had been guilty of fornication, as Joseph thought that she was, he would have had the right to put her away and take another wife because their marriage had not yet been consummated the consummation is the finalization the sealing of something and the consummation that this is speaking of is the consummation of the covenant the consummation of God dealing with his people Israel when the time of the Gentiles is finished and God will deal with his people Israel again and take a remnant out of them which will obey him 
because his spirit is in them and he shall sprinkle clean water upon them and put his law in their hearts and they will keep it and serve him as they were supposed to all along but they weren't circumcised in the heart like God told them to be and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate and that is of course the wrath of God being poured out upon the nations of this world in the time of Jacob's trouble or the great tribulation so let's read the last two verses over again with a better understanding because the whole thing makes perfect sense when you read it in the light of the word of God by the spirit of Christ and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week hallelujah he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate so seventy weeks were determined upon Daniel's people and upon the holy city Jerusalem sixty-nine of those weeks passed between the time that the commandment was given to restore and to build Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah the Prince and the seventieth week began when Messiah the Prince was baptized in the Jordan River and began his ministry at the age of thirty even as it was written that the priests in the temple would begin their ministry at the age of thirty and after that time it was half of that week, three and a half years, that Jesus Christ did what he came to do. And he knew that it would be that amount of time. And when he was finished with that three and a half years, then he did what he came to do. And he was cut off out of the land of the living, Isaiah 53, 8. And he was cut off not for himself, but for his own sheep. And for the world. Yea, even for those that, that reject him. Christ died to save all the whole world. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially of them that believe. Okay, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Titus and his army destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And that week, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That week began when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. And in the midst of that week, three and a half years into that week, halfway through that week, the Son of God was crucified. And the second half of that week is yet to come. It is called the Great Tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. And the book of the Revelation says three times in three different places that it is a period of 42 months, 1,260 days. It is a period of three and a half years. And that is the second half of the week. And we right now are, are in a parenthesis between the first half and the second half of the week because of the grace of God that the time of the Gentiles might be completed, that anyone in this whole world who desires to come into the covenant of the living God and to the people of Israel may do so by turning from their sins and believing on the name of Jesus Christ and being baptized in his name for the remission of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and walking in the commandments of God. That is the gospel of the New Testament, which began to be preached, preached on the day of Pentecost, 33 AD, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is what the scripture is talking about in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, and it's specifically the last two verses. And there's a lot of things that I've just explained to you that are totally contrary to what you've heard and what you've read in all the famous uh, videos and books of the famous prophecy teachers that are so popular and prevalent nowadays, and they're so rich with your money or with the money of many people, maybe not your money, hopefully not your money. But these prophecy teachers, are, are they're peddling a lie to you. Okay, they're peddling a lie to you. If they were telling you the truth, then they wouldn't be charging you money for their books, or their videos, or their seminars. But they're not telling you the truth. They're making merchandise of you, and they're telling you lies, and deceiving you. And if you'll just search the scriptures, God will show you the truth. And that's what I've given you today. If you have earnest questions about what I've spoken, go ahead and comment, write me a PM, whatever. Um, if you just want to argue, I, you won't find an opponent with me. I have no time for arguing just for the sake of arguing. And I don't really care to argue about prophecy either. You might have a different opinion. That's your right. Um, you may see something that I haven't seen, and if that's the case, I, I'm happy to receive that. Um, but if you just want to argue, you're going to have to go somewhere else. I'm not into theology or theological discussions or or um, um, 
what's the word I'm trying to think of now? Uh, philosophy, philosoph philosophical discussions. Um, I have no interest in such things at all. The only thing I'm interested in is what the scripture says. So um, if you have a comment or a question, please go ahead and leave it, uh, and I'd be happy to help you. My name is Clinton. To those of you who are in Christ Jesus, I'm your brother, Brother Clinton. And I hope you've been blessed by these things, and I hope that you'll continue to be blessed as you grow in God's word. Peace to you.